Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for June 21st, 2021. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets them before we move on. Although this week we're going to have, we're going to use the same format we used last week, which is we're going to open it up so that those who are interested in responding to any question can unmute themselves and share your video. A, a quick reminder that we are going to include your video. So if you don't want to appear on screen as you're answering, turn your video off. Otherwise, you will be part of the finished video. Also, a reminder that if you talk or we see you, you know, you respond on video or audio and you're uncomfortable with what you've said or embarrassed, uh, don't hesitate to drop me a note in the chat because we can edit you out. So we want as much participation as we can get. We don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. So just start over if you if you misspeak, and uh, we'll fix it in editing. Someone and said everybody that, participated really. We had a lot of action last week, and we were really excited about it. So thanks everybody for joining in. Liz said it seemed great, and everybody's participation was wonderful. So I think shout out to Todd, our great editor. Right, for exactly. Making us all look better than we actually managed <laughs> to do live. Mr. Todd <laughs> fixes it all. <laughs> we are so also true. streaming the web webcast live on Facebook, so you sh can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them as well. We're going to start, as we usually do, by recapping last week's weekly tittle, which was called Tokimeku. And that is the phrase the Japanese phrase that has been translated as spark joy and various other ways. The assignment was to choose a small category of items that you're trying to declutter and to evaluate them using the KonMari method principles. We'd love to hear from anyone who tried that this week, who experimented with the KonMari method. Please let us know in the comments. We didn't get a lot of responses to the tittle specifically this week, but I wanted to share part of a very thoughtful comment from CM on YouTube. CM said, a better way to spark joy is to share your joy with others. I feel like a kinder, better person when I give to relatives, friends, or charities things I already cherish myself. And that generous feeling sparks joy a lot, sparks a lot more joy than if I just keep all of my favorite things for only me. I think the act of decluttering can become real spiritual work in giving away to others some of our favorite things. Most importantly, when I give some of my favorite things to relatives or friends, I always take a digital photo of me with them and that favorite thing. I thought this was such an interesting comment about adapting to the concept of sparking joy. Uh, CM is focusing on how the letting go process can spark joy as an alternative to sparking joy, helping you decide what to keep. I like the idea of spreading the positive focus to all aspects to the decluttering process. And frankly, anything that helps you stay positive while you do this work is a bonus. I just thought her focus was an interesting spin, especially since so many people have trouble with the concept of either everything sparks joy to them because they love all their stuff or sparking joy isn't a good enough um, idea for keeping it like it's sparking joy doesn't mean anything to them and so she's focusing on how you feel and how you can receive joy from giving things away and I thought that was a really great alternative you're having trouble with the concept of sparking joy up front then maybe this is a way that uh, you can look at it at a different angle and still participate. Thanks for the comment. We appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> Maxi asked in the comments, can we see last week's session? And so that this seems like a great moment to remind people that you can always see our previous uh, webcasts on YouTube. If you go to cfhou.com slash YouTube, we post recordings of each week's meeting 
edited videos about a day after the, the live meeting. Let's get right to it. We're talking all Marie Kondo today. So, well, no, let me let me have share a tittle response from CJ. Okay. I decided I decided to re-listen to the audiobook and go through the first category again, starting with subcategory of dresses and skirts for summer. I use the alternate question you provided for Spark Joy of do you feel a thrill when you touch it? Ooh. Only had two items left that met that criteria and also currently fit me. Haven't been able, been able to let go of all the rest yet. But that was a good filter. At least you, um, you know, you took one of the alternative translations of, say it again, tokumeku. 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 Thank you. Um, it, you took one of the alternate uh, translations and, and were able to apply it to your category. Good job. And uh, keep practicing and see if it'll get easier with time. We talked about last week, somebody mentioned the idea of putting it in the uh, I'm not sure yet pile, uh, which works as long as everything doesn't go in it. <laughs> but, but it is a good interim stage to say, I'm thinking about this one. I'm unsure about this one and putting it aside. And if only two things fit and make you feel good about it, uh, the rest can be in the maybe thinking about a pile and maybe you can circle back to that pile later and, and let it go after a little bit of rest time. Deborah had a, uh, a, an interesting comment on the quote we, we shared at the start. She says, I think there's a danger there to wait for the perfect unicorn grateful recipient. Wonderful when it works, but I wonder if some hold on to clutter waiting for someone else's gratitude. Well, or it, it's, it's definitely not a high volume solution. If right. you have a really big project and you have a lot to do, it's very hard to distribute everything to the exact right person in something less than a decade. So you have to, if you are trying to make headway on the project and you have a lot to let go of, it probably will grind your project to a halt if everything has to go to somebody that receives it with great joy. Um, it, it just slows it down. But if you are at the process where the house you're done and the house is in good shape and you, now you're in maintenance mode and you're, uh, you know, giving away specific things to people and you can get joy from somebody else loving it. That's awesome. I mean, any way that you can reward yourself for the work that you've done is something to be uh, celebrated and made use of for sure. Okay, let's get right to the heart of the matter because we did not have nearly enough time for it last week. I know, our right? first, Our first Marie Kondo episode last week generated so much conversation, we decided to extend this topic to be a three-part series. Marie Kondo's best-selling book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, upended the conventional wisdom about organizing and introduced a new approach to decluttering, the KonMari method. Today, we're going to continue our, our exploration of the KonMari approach to organizing in conversation with you, our audience members who've used it or tried it. Um, I'll also remind everybody, we, uh, we put together a list of quotations and questions in response to those quotations that we shared a couple of weeks ago. And if there's anyone who did not get a chance to take, take that survey, it's still available and we'll still be, still be reviewing your responses and including your contributions through next week. So I'll share a link in the, uh, in the chat and also in the show notes on YouTube and so on. So, where we left off last week, we had talked about uh, whether uh, tidying your space transforms it in some way. And so we were the question. The next question we were we had asked was, did you after you tidied your space using the Marie Kondo method or other methods in combination, did you notice a more conscious need to keep your space clear? Or did you return to the same level of disorganization sometime afterwards? And uh, that created a lot of response. <laughs> yeah, we got a, we got a lot a lot of response to that. And uh, I wanted to share one from. Let's see if I can find it here. Genevieve said, 
in her book, Marie Kondo is very insistent on completing the process fully and in one go. Since I did not do that, I don't think I can really comment on whether doing so is magical and foolproofedly irreversible. The degree of her fervor in asserting that no one goes back to clutter after finishing her process sounds compelling and inspired curiosity, but apparently not enough for me to have done everything she suggests. <laughs> Which I thought was a great, you know, very positive way of saying, yeah, it didn't make me want to do it that bad. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> and, and I, and I still, uh, this is part of the issue that I think everybody has. Um, I still think that she comes from um, uh, smaller collections of stuff. And if you have, and she's a younger person. And so if you have a lifetime, a household of stuff, the idea of pulling it all out and doing it all at once seems really overwhelming and, and waiting to get to the end of the project to be inspired not to mess again. Um, I'm not sure everybody can get to that place, but I do have clients who say, and I see this generally with my clients that if you are, if you spend money for me to be there helping you, if you put a bunch of time and effort into it, then the area that you decluttered, you don't usually like you get irritated faster as it starts to get messy. So your threshold, your tolerance for chaos starts to go down um, because you put a bunch of effort into fixing it and you don't want to lose the effort that you made. You don't want to give up all the hard work that you did. And so um, I do find that people are at least inspired by, man, I, you know, worked my patootie off to make that be clear. And I don't need that to be a mess again. And so you get back in motion sooner rather than later because you put your own blood and sweat and tears into cleaning it up and it makes a difference. So don't forget, um, this is where, you know, if you want to make a comment, do your little raise hand feature from yeah, the um, reaction well, and in, section. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and switch so that participants can unmute themselves but we do uh, we do ask you to hold up your hand so we can we can call on you but um i'd love to we'd love to hear your responses to to each of these questions as we go through cj responded to the survey and said i did notice a strong inclination to maintain to maintaining the clear space however different life events cause a resurgence of chaos for example Weight fluctuations and painting the bedroom caused a return to some disorganization of the closet bedroom. And of course, COVID in March 2020 caused a complete upheaval in the sorting of books, papers, and other miscellaneous items as space had to be made for working from home with two separate spaces or Zoom meetings with appropriate backgrounds and sound blocking. That affected everybody. I just want you to know you're not yeah. alone. Everybody scrambled to make their Zoom background work for them to go to work or school or whatever they were doing. <laughs> Pat, go ahead. Well, I would just say that um, it'll never be as bad as it was because a lot of the things are gone. Yes, you know, ma'am. Getting rid of a lot of things. Um, although my, my tough area is my kitchen. Um, I tend to neglect dishes for a while. And then every Tuesday afternoon, I clean my kitchen with you guys. <laughs> hey, decluttering by Clutter Fairy Remote. I love yes. it. <laughs> Whatever works, sister. We're happy to help. <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. M said, I got a place completely decluttered and felt frustrated because there seemed to be nothing to do. Seems as if I need some degree of active project available. Because you were frustrated that there wasn't anything to do? We, 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 we applaud you for arriving at that place. The rest of us right. are in total awe that you have made it there. That's astonishing. <laughs> well, I, I would love to hear Em expand on that. I, I know I experienced the, the phenomenon that if I put everything away, so it's neat and tidy, like when I've arranged my workspace so that no work is visible, 
it does sort of create this feeling in me that there I have no work. I must be I must be all caught up because there's nothing in my face. I am one of those people who who need some visual reminders. Yeah, yeah. I need yeah. something to remind me. Oh yeah, you put that away. It's it didn't cease to exist. It it didn't stop getting. It doesn't stop needing attention. It's just hiding. <laughs> Maida has her hand up. Go ahead, Maida. You have to unmute yourself. It, okay. Hi, dear. Um. Hi there. I'm. I wish I was in more of this conversation. It's really great. I I read both of those books, and it's um. She's a got some good ideas. I will say it made me feel good to see all my clothes, like I did all my pants and workout stuff together. But uh -huh. I also put, I changed it a little bit by putting elastic bands around everything because I know when a fury, like stuff is going to get knocked over and undone. And so that way I can kind of rummage around in it. So it makes me happy like that. Like I can still find things, but I don't fold it the way she did. I do it to a point and then I band it so that if, Oh. the whole if I create the, the whole drawer falls over whole bin falls on the floor it's not undone oh that's clever so it sort of keeps it folded because you've got a band around it yeah I think it's some kind of military method I didn't make that up I saw it somewhere <laughs> I've seen that somewhere so instead of like I, you can use rubber bands but I use those little um like even like long uh hair elastic bands yeah yeah and like then sometimes ties. I use the clear um like drawstring bags because they're clearer than Ziplocs and they're just easier for me to work with. Right. That's awesome. I like it. it, it and it's a good way, you know, you're earthquake proof now <laughs> if, if your dresser falls over, but there's nothing worse than, a, so the beady equivalent of that is you, you have all your beads sorted on a tray and then the cat comes and walks and or knocks the tray off and all the beads go flying everywhere and it's complete destruction. Like, yeah, that's super annoying. So that's the uh, clothing equivalent of it. And I like your idea. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Let's move on to the next question, Gail, because okay. I, 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 I want to try to make sure we wrap this up in three episodes. <laughs> OK, <laughs> OK, OK. So here is the uh, quotation number four. Just like the gentle shake we use to wake someone up, we can stimulate our belongings by physically moving them exposing them to fresh air and making them conscious she has conscious in quotes so the for our first question about that quote was do you experience any change in the consciousness of your belongings through the experience of handling each item whether that's literally or metaphorically a little bit more than half of respondents said yes so that's a, not an unpopular idea but not not an overwhelming response in favor the, the follow-up question to that was, if you answered yes, please elaborate on how the method has changed your perception of or feelings about the items you've, you've handled. Um, and one of our respondents, I will have to look up the name, said, I believe everything animate and so-called inanimate has consciousness. I believe in feng shui. I know when I rearrange furniture or knickknacks, or even hanging clothes or which folded clothes go into which dresser drawers, energy changes with in the, with in the house. Energy gets stagnated, especially if there is a depressed or ill person in the house or emotional conflict. There's more to that response, but it was a very long one. So, um, and then there were some, there was the whole, we had the whole gamut of answers to that question from, you know, full, full throated support of Marie Kondo's point of view to, no, that's a bunch of nonsense. It's a bunch of hooey. And I'd love to hear what what those who are with us live have to say about it. Any hand? There is hands? Anita. Yes, yes. Go Anita. ahead, Anita. If, if it's true that they're all, they all have, you know, life in them and everything, I'm afraid my stuff would come attack me. I mean, <laughs> so much of it. <laughs> really? No, no, I get they oh, no, I cannot get that emotionally involved with that many inanimate objects. There are too many of them. Okay. Yeah, no, not gonna right. work for me. Anita says yeah. no. Okay. Susan. Oh, Susan, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ahead, it was Susan. it was Susan. Okay. I'm sorry. Read the wrong so, name. So it's okay. Um, so one of the things I noticed for me is in handling the things, okay. Um I'm looking at them in a different way than if I were reaching for them to use them immediately, you know? Okay. 
whether it's clothing or whether it's uh, you know a decoration or something, I'm, I'm looking at it more harshly and I'm seeing it for how it is now. And oftentimes I would say something is really shabby, although I may still love it. Uh, maybe I really don't like how it looks. Yeah, so I was able to part with some things because I was looking at it from a different perspective, not, not to functionally grab it and use it but to just look at it and examine it. And you know how things will fade and they'll just start to look really worn. And you're not always aware of that when you're using them day in and day out, you know? So I was able to part with more things that uh, in a conscious way. You know? and, and there's something to be said for it, when it sort of faded into the background and you're not paying any attention to it anymore. You don't really notice it as much. You don't realize it's there, but when you start picking it up and rolling it around and getting very clear about what's there and what it looks like, you, you're getting new information. You're getting fresh data to work with. And so, Precisely. Good, yeah. yeah, good, good process for you. I'm glad it worked. Thanks for sharing. Rosemary is up. You I'm know, so thank glad you. this uh, topic of feng shui is being discussed. I had an organizer a number of years ago and she told me she was into feng shui. And so she would come in my house and she would want to do everything her way and say well this is feng shui or you should throw this as ways because it's feng shui and she say now if you do this this is going to draw money and after that i didn't want i would tell any organizer i didn't believe in it and and so it's really soured me on this whole thing and i wonder what your take on this feng shui was because i my experience it was very manipulative Oh, all right. Organize. So, I mean, she would say, "Oh, you need to, you need to organize these these pots and paint." Even though I didn't want to do this because it was feng shui and it would help my feeling of my house and my karma, my chakras. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what you're describing to me is an organizer who's being a little bit too enthusiastic about defining your priorities for you, and so she. It sounds like she was trying to. Um, set the agenda without your participation in what was most important to work on. And it, she was using those parameters, which clearly you didn't buy into. And so it wasn't really helping her, um, you know, get in sync no. with you and working on what you thought was important. And yes, after that, it, 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 we parted. I mean, uh, that, that was not satisfactory to me. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Well, and I, and I'm not sure that Marie Kondo is particularly advocating about. She uh, does mention it. Does she talk about it in the book? Yeah, but it's, but it's, you know, her idea of this stuff is handling it makes it more conscious is something that's very easy to say. I mean, it's very easy for me to say it's, if it's sitting in the house and you've been ignoring it, it's out of sight and you don't have good. Um, you know, you don't have a good right. understanding. You don't remember what's there. You don't know what condition it's in. Right. You're not really paying attention to it. And just turning your focus on it makes a shift in your ability to notice it and make decisions about it. And, and that in particular um, does create movement. And it's just because you're focusing on it. And, and, and that makes sense, but it doesn't have supernatural powers. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Thanks, Rosemary. Thank Thanks you. for being here. I'm glad you're here. Deborah had a good comment on that when she said it makes me conscious of the belongings themselves. I don't yeah. believe that inanimate items have sentience, but I do believe that I do and my <laughs> feelings toward an item are important. Yeah. You know, one of the things that struck me as I was reading the book the last time was that there's, I feel like there's a little bit, bit of a danger in the, you know, examining your items and trying a little too hard to to stir up your own feelings about them that that it it goes a little bit too much in that direction of identifying with your stuff which is something that we have talked a lot about you know finding boundaries between yourself and your stuff mm -hmm. and to a certain extent i feel like that's that's we and we we encourage people to remember that your stuff is not who you are yeah because it's too easy to identify with your stuff and hang on to it because it means something about 
who you used to be or who you'd like to be and 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 reminding people your stuff is not you helps makes it easier for some people to let it go yeah let's go to linda i had a comment with uh the um the thanking the item in service so i'm not sure if this is the particular time no matter go right ahead um I had uh, seen this psychologist on YouTube warning against um, the Marie. Well, actually, that's another thing. She was warning actually against the Marie Kondo folding method for people with OCD and perfectionism. She said someone with OCD and perfectionism could become more crippled by Mm -hmm. following a rigid and ritualistic folding dictum. Everything had to be folded perfectly in a certain way. And then another uh, therapist had found that patients' OCD became worse by thanking the item for the service because it was like they were assigning a human quality to the item. And uh, I guess they would feel guilty or sad for getting rid of it. Oh, So that mm-hmm. uh, it was making the people at this... Um, mental health facility far worse it was harder for them OCD. their ocd got worse thinking that was almost a you know uh, sort of like the lady who was just talking about the uh she was just on talking about the feng shui i i like feng shui to a certain extent too but i i don't want to cross the line like she said either but Apparently, these people uh, were already having problems, and and it just uh, it's easier for them to pick up new kind of phobias and things, I guess. Well, and certainly anybody that's that's struggling with a mental health condition has to filter um, what they choose to do through what supports um, them staying in a healthy mindset. And so, yeah, I can see where it might read to someone with OCD like. Oh, I have to follow a particular method and that might be a struggle for them. Yeah. Well, so if you have um, any, uh, what, I, what I think of as comorbidities, if you have any kind of a mental health issue that is on board along while you're doing your decluttering, just keep that in mind. If you find that what she's, what Marie Kondo is suggesting that you do is increasing your stress instead of decreasing your stress just assume that it isn't really going to work for you and you can let it go. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Linda. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank can you. I add something here? Sure, Deborah. Is that Deborah? Um, oh, yeah. yes, it is. I, uh, for a while, was a member of a, a minimalism Facebook page and um, I saw something that was quite disturbing. Um, it was a great trend that uh, people were considering basic human needs as um, a requirement from, or sorry, an inhibition for um, becoming truly minimalist. So for example, there was a case of a mattress on the floor, a bottom sheet and one pillow. And I could see blinds in the background and the person asked, is this too much? Is it hoarding? Oh my gosh. And, um, more than a hundred respondents said, yes, get rid of the pillow. That is clutter. Oh my so gosh. We're talking about a few different things with minimalism. And when people have issues around, um, like I see this as the flip side of hoarding in terms yeah, yeah, of yeah, a yeah. mental health issue. It is an obsession and yeah. it's an obsession that leads to self-abnegation. And self-abnegation is not the same thing as um, being minimalist and, and living, still living your best life because mm. of getting rid of things. So I wanted to throw that in there, that there's a mental health issue on that side. On as well. both ends, right? Mm-hmm. On each end of the spectrum. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And I'm guessing that most of the people in our group are not in that category <laughs> so and just... that's why i left that group <laughs> right <laughs> thank you for sharing and we're gonna hope that all the rest of you guys are um not uh, doing without a pillow that is very extreme 
Okay. <laughs> a few more comments on the, on this topic. Rowan said part of hoarding disorder is often anthropomorphizing of objects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Think of everybody's collection of teddy bears and how much you love the teddy bears and feel bad about letting go of them. Well, and a couple of people in response to this specific question, Christine said, touching an object makes you emotionally bond again with that object. So the condo method of handling things makes it even harder to discard things. Mm. And, an, and another one, another person said, but on the, you know, this is, but on the other hand, Mim said, touching the item helped me prepare to donate it in some instances or at least move it so it wasn't part of the perpetual landscape never yeah. really seen yeah i mean and, and ultimately you are going to have to touch everything in order to clean it arrange it organize it declutter it let it go like at some point you're gonna have to touch it so um it's just a matter of uh, registering how that makes your process easier or harder yeah let's move on to the next question yeah the best sequence, this is her, this is a quote about the order to sort in. The best sequence is this, clothes first, then books, papers, kimono um, is her word, which is defined as miscellany, and lastly, mementos. So the question we came up with is, did you follow Marie Kondo's prescribed order of categories as you put the KonMari method into practice? Yeah, and... By a two to one majority, the answer to this one was no. Two thirds of people said they did not. not like not, a, not only no, but hell no. <laughs> right. <laughs> <clears throat> the next, the follow-up question was, were there any categories with which you had particular difficulty? And I'll, I'll start with my answer to that one. Well, for starters, I think it sort of reveals something that Komono miscellany um, is just is only one category for Marie Kondo, and I looked I looked at that list and said, "Well, that's eighty percent of my house." <laughs> yeah, kitchen kitchen wares alone are a category that could take me weeks to sort. Yeah, so lumping yeah. lumping those and tools and electronics and you know i when i start thinking of what falls into that what doesn't fall into those other categories it it's i'm immediately overwhelmed and go why don't you go ahead i'm sorry but what is ocd uh, obsessive compulsive disorder thank you i think that that category of, of miscellany is really 80 percent of anybody's house like yes everybody has clothes and yes, everybody has some volume of books, whether or not they actually are a reader or they inherited the books. And yes, everybody has papers and God knows everybody has papers. But then it's everything else. <laughs> then the whole rest of the house falls under that category. And, and it's, it's hard to think of that as one area. And mementos is usually paper and photos and a few 3D things, not usually very many 3D things. And so... It is a huge amount of volume in a typical American home in particular, those things that are not in the other four categories. And so she's slicing out clothes, which is a big, you know, everybody has issues with clothes and books and papers. And those are all big long-term projects that you have to compare all the pieces to each other to make good choices but then literally that's, and then here's the whole rest of your house. And so I, it, it is a big trying to target that whole section as you definitely have to subcategorize it. Like you said, Ed, like you couldn't do to pull all the rest of the house out and try to sort it and mess with it. Like, good luck with that. I think everybody would drown under that process. So it is a um, it is a fourth category that really is hiding a million other categories <laughs> in my point of view, and I don't know whether that's just you know Marie Kondo didn't ever have that much more, or she hadn't been to very many American households at that point <laughs> to see what other what would fall in miscellany. You know, I mean, you think of miscellaneous as the little extras. But in my house, that would be a very big category. Ginger commented, I keep an inventory of our things. I usually 
make a round through everything throughout the year. This helps me question how much of these things we use and need. I was surprised by how few of my clothes I actually wear in retirement. We definitely prefer two sets of sheets per bed. We, we limited bath towel sets, but we also replace worn items with good quality items and we keep decluttering more each round. Most of the maybe items become became no items. Yeah, you just need a minute, right? You just need to like think about it for a second before you can do that. Yeah, that's good. Susan said, I think you can give yourself permission to determine your own specific categories. Yeah. And subcategories, I mean, and we've talked about, particularly for people who are overwhelmed, the idea of doing 80% of your house in one, in one go as one category would be completely a total shutdown. And that's sort of usually how people who are overwhelmed see it. Like I will, they say to me, I don't know where to start, which says to me immediately, I'm looking at the whole house and I'm trying to think about organizing the whole house at once. And that makes my brain go boop, 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 <laughs> and shuts down and that's the end of it. And so um, it, our advice about getting over overwhelm is always <clears throat> about get smaller, get smaller, get smaller. If you can't do the house, do the room. If you can't do the room, do the table. If you can't do the table, do the drawer. Like get into a, the smaller space, the smallest space where you stop feeling completely overwhelmed and unable to get started. And that allows you to make some motion. And so you're really subcategorizing your stuff down to the place where you are no longer overwhelmed. And going through that, going into that, collection of how do I start my house it's going to have to be in a subcategory where you can make forward motion is my point can I jump in yes um it was two or three years ago Gail um I was listening to one of your meetups before we did these zooms and um somebody wasn't sure there were ailing parents and ailing in-laws in different states of the U.S. and this person didn't know um they whether to pack for Arizona or pack for Alaska, basically. And you made a suggestion that has stuck with me forever and will continue to. And you said you don't need all your winter coats if you move to Alaska, but you might, it wasn't Alaska, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and weather. you had suggested that in every category, that person declutter by 10%. And I have used that forever. And I think that applies in the KonMari system as well. So if you can't do all of a category, do 10%. And I do that about once a year. Well, actually a couple times a year. I'll think, how many scarves do I have? Oh, approximately 40, but who's counting? And um, <laughs> so, um, and I'll get rid of four. So uh, yeah, anyway, I think that applies in this particular situation. Right. And 10% is a, is such a small number. It feels like it feels so much less painful when you think I'm only giving up 10%, like it's meaningless. And so getting rid of four scarves out of 40, you still have a plethora of scarves, but you still have shrunk the population a little bit. And even four, even four scarves is forward motion. And, and that's ultimately the goal. Like, if you can't make any progress other than 10%, you're still getting 10% out. And every time you do that, you make a little bit more room. CJ said in re-listening to the book, Marie Kondo does provide the desired order of subcategories for all of the kimono miscell miscellaneous that is reasonable. I have, I'll take a look at that this week and maybe we can talk more about revisit. that. Revisit. Revisit the big category. Oh, here, actually, CJ put it in. The or, sorting order in the book, CDs and DVDs, skincare products, makeup, accessories, valuables, electrical equipment and appliances, household equipment, household supplies, kitchen goods and food supplies, other. Thank you for sharing that, CJ. That, that's really helpful. It's interesting that skincare products is a subcategory. And way up high on the list, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> hmm. okay. Well, I guess everybody has their subcategory, so there's no judgment on my part. Whatever right. works, right? <laughs> and if those categories don't work for you, you can move on to categories that do, right? Can you read those again? Yes. 
CDs and DVDs, skincare products, makeup, accessories. I'm not sure what accessories is. I'll, I have to look at the book to clarify that. Valuables, electrical equipment and appliances, household equipment, household supplies. I would assume that means like cleaning supplies and, and such. Kitchen goods and food supplies and other. That's an odd list, but it works. It's a, it's a possibility, right? Oh, Ginger accessories. Has... Emma says belts, purses, hair bows. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Okay. Jewelry Ginger made. has her hand up. Go ahead, Ginger. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I started the KonMari thing back in 2014. It really wasn't a one and done thing for me, right. but I did break mine down into list and that's from for an every year I repeat it and do like an inventory and my personal I call it personal care instead of whatever that personal whatever it was and I've actually got it broken down into um skin care hair care face care teeth care nail care perfume right 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 I, I broke it down like that and uh electrical I broke down into electronics cameras appliances and cables and household equipment, I, I, I have household equipment and household supplies. And household equipment to me was things you use in your linens, gift wrap, office supplies, sewing supplies, vases. I had 17 flower vases when I pulled them all together. Right. Um, and I, um, a local florist took most of those for me. Um, and fire extinguisher, any tools and hardware, you know, those kinds of things picture frames reusable bags and household supplies to me was more consumable things like right, right, cleaning right. products laundry, laundry products batteries candles light bulbs filters Toilet you know makeup. home sense you know <laughs> yeah and yeah in the kitchen i broke it down into into things like cooking items baking items drinking items um food storage canning it and even food you know i uh, just to see what we had in the way of food stored, you know, Yeah, but yeah, those exactly. kinds of things, I, I made it through most, most of it, the categories I haven't done much of yet is office supplies. And I'll be doing that this week. I've, it, it's because I've been forced to deal with something that's pulled office supplies out. And I said, okay, well now's the time to do it. Apparently all. now I'm doing office supplies, right? <laughs> right. And, and I didn't do um, my craft supplies yet. They're, you know, I keep thinking there's nothing there I should want to uh, get rid of, but there is, of course, I can but already you know there mind. is, <laughs> Picture, yeah. but it's, it's been an, it's been an eye opening experience for me to see, like, for example, I have 77 teeth care items. Oh, my. You know why? Why? Those free kits you get from the dental hygiene. I know, right? <laughs> so I started offloading those to like the local charity the um church you know well and i have to tell you i leave mine behind at the dentist I yeah don't that's home. that's good that's good I, i've done that but so there's some useful things in there that i take out and then i get rid of the stuff that i don't need right but um yeah it, that's it's been an eye-opening experience for me now i do the inventory just because i kind of geek out on numbers anyway that's just me and i also set up like a storage plan for the house and it just came about from trying to find things and put things, you know, for this process, pull in right. the vases that I thought, why do I have vases tucked here, there, and everywhere? They should have a place. And those kind of, and so I wound up with every drawer and every cabinet has kind of a name, a purpose. That's, you know, even in my bedside table, I'm surprised the top drawers most frequently used items I might need, but the second drawer was holding a fitness equipment gear. Um, um in there and the bottom drawer is holding uh keepsakes it just it started becoming coming together as things have a place and then when i go through them i go through them almost like a category a mini category right and you're creating kind of systems yeah, for it's, everything it's, that's basically what you're doing right you, it, you're it, doing great working. ginger that's great awesome but yes Thanks. there's a lot of there's a lot of KonMari lists out there on the internet too that have oh, broken yeah. down all these categories oh that's good and to reflect the fact that Miss Laney was not really doing it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. I appreciate it. 
Connie said, I think she needs to include crafts in its own category. Oh, hell yeah. And that, and that is <laughs> certainly true for, it seems like a pretty large sub, you know, a pretty large section of our audience. Uh, right. Our crafty people. Sandra, why don't you go ahead? What's happening, Sandra? Uh, hi. Hi from um, Birmingham in the UK, England. Hi. Um, Thanks for joining yeah, just, us. Just, just going on from what um, the previous lady was just saying about having categories for what's in your cupboard and stuff. Um, I'm disabled and um, I have three care staff who have to come and look after me. And um, when it was just one staff, it was fine because they got the stuff out the cupboards, they cooked, they loaded the dishwasher, they emptied the dishwasher, they put the stuff away. Now I have a team of three. One of them cooks, another one loads the dishwasher, and another one's there when the dishwasher's done the following day and has to empty it and then doesn't know where the stuff goes. Um, so we've come up with systems of, you know, we, we've, um, as I call it, we've labelled the heck out of everything. <laughs> and we've got, um, we've got um, you can get, you know, whiteboards that you write on with a, yeah, yeah, with, uh, with dry erase markers. Well, you can buy that on a sticky roll. Um, you oh, know, um, yeah, yeah. And obviously it's available widely from, you know, the usual big online place that we all know that I'm not going to mention. Um, <laughs> and um, so I got my, my care staff to, so sort of like the outside of the fridge, the outside of the freezer, the inside of the cupboard doors for the food, the inside of the doors for like all the pots and pans and the spices. So now we have a, and we've drawn a line across where each shelf is or where each drawer is in the freezer. And then we've labeled them like shelf one, shelf two, or top shelf, middle shelf, bottom shelf. And then we have a list or in some cases, photographs of the item and saying this item goes on this shelf so that the lady who cooks can find the stuff where to get it out. And then after she's cooked, it goes in the dishwasher, but obviously the dishwasher goes on just before she leaves. And then it's the, the care staff who come the following day, which is the same person who empties the dishwasher. And now she knows where to put the stuff back to because she opens the door and there's a photograph. And there's a map. On what shelf or there's, a, you know, or there's a, a label telling you when I have a food, food shop delivery come, the person who has to, deal with the food shop because I don't have any strength anymore I can't like lift stuff so she knows well this is the shelf where all the tins go on this is the shelf where the x y and z goes on and obviously we've got storage jars and boxes that are again labeled so they know well, this is where the pasta goes this is where everything else yeah, goes. yeah 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 they have a they have a chart to follow which is excellent yeah exactly and also I've got a little kitchenette up here upstairs for because I'm not always able to do the stairs i've got balance issues and stuff and um and so they know they've got a list so they know what has to come back up here after it's been washed how much plates how much crockery i have up here and also what food comes up here so it's really good and then the best thing about having the lists on the outside of the fridge and the freezer and the food cupboard door is on a friday before they leave they take photographs of it and send it up to me <laughs> and then when i'm going through my trying to do my online shopping for my food i just look at the photographs they've sent me and i can see what we've run out of and what we've still got and that keeps you from buying too much and that you it know then you're, because, you keep you from because, being overstocked yeah, I, I in the past i didn't know what i was got so i was buying sort of like too much of one thing and then finding oh we couldn't make this because actually there's not enough got, of that we've only got two of the ingredients and we've run out of the others and i didn't know and therefore didn't order it and yeah whatever <laughs> Excellent. That's really great. Thanks for sharing, Sandra. And that sounds like a very organized, you know, effective, productive household. So well, it seems like you worked it there. out. We get there. We won't. We, I won't tell you about the, the spare bedroom and the box room. Oh, that's all right. That's another conversation. That, that's but but they're sort of, but we're working on those. <laughs> well, and they're doing what they need to do to support you and yeah. and make that work. And that's the most important thing. So good job. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Anita said that picture map idea is also an excellent training method for children who want to help. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. 
having pictures. Um, a, a lot of people do that with the toy boxes or um, containers that they have toys in and putting little pictures of the toys on the boxes allows somebody that's not old enough to read to know that the trains go in the bucket with the picture of the train on it. Yeah, yeah. Labels are helpful for everybody. Okay, are we on to the survey? Not quite. I wanted to share a comment from Stacy, who's watching on Facebook. She said, I follow the minimalists, Joshua and Ryan, and other similar minded people. They are not extremists. They promote minimalism that is correct for the individual, not Spartanism like the group the lady mentioned were promoting. Yeah. And uh, I also wanted to take a second to say happy birthday to Eloise, who's a, a very frequent uh Frequent flyer. <laughs> Frequent flyer. Happy birthday and feliz cumpleaños. Oh, good job. I would not have been able to do that. <laughs> okay, let's, yeah, let's go on to the next question. Okay, so here's uh, quote number six. Uh, their selection criteria, does it spark joy? The criterion is, of course, whether or not it gives you a thrill of pleasure when you touch it or you've mastered what's inside. Instead, take each book in your hand and decide whether it moves you or not. Keep, it, keep things because you love them, not just because. Sorting will proceed smoothly and you'll be amazed by your capacity to choose on the basis of what gives you pleasure. Always only keep the things that inspire joy. So those, this was a collection of does it spark joy comments. And our question to the survey was, do you find the criterion of sparking joy an effective and sufficient one for making decisions about what to keep as you declutter your space? And again, the, our, our audience's reaction to this was 68% uh, said no, 32% <laughs> said yes. Now, I should say our survey was in no way a scientific survey <laughs> right. there's clearly there's a selection bias because people who are listening to our podcast are obviously still still struggling, struggling with their yeah, clutter yeah. so if sparking joys was sufficient for them and and it had enabled them to get everything done once and for all they probably wouldn't still be here right. and filling exactly. out our survey exactly well the, i was going to say the follow-up question was please explain what problems or challenges the sparking joy criterion presented for you. And uh, one we heard in various forms quite a bit was my emotions change a lot from moment to moment. And if you choose your wardrobe based on sparks joy, you could end up with a totally uncoordinated collection of clothes. <laughs> right. That's a possibility. Oh, we got all kinds of hands up on that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got Sandra first. So go ahead, Sandra. Uh, hi. Um, yeah. I mean, spark joy works in theory, but as a disabled person, I can tell you the commode in my bedroom does not spark joy, but boy, do I need it. <laughs> right? Exactly. And the virtually <laughs> from floor almost to the ceiling bookcase that I used to have in my kitchen, while well, the bookcase is still there, but it used to be full of purely cookbooks. Now I can no longer cook because I'm a danger with the with the appliances and stuff because of my memory and what have you. Um, and obviously my my staff, although they do cook for me, it's very simple basic food because they don't have time to do elaborate right. um, stuff. So although the cookbooks sparked my joy, I had to get rid of them. So yeah, it, you couldn't continue. To you use don't them. always have the choice depending on what's going on in your life right to be able to keep what sparks your joy and get rid of things that you really wouldn't want to have in your house but you have to have them because you need them because you need to function thank you thanks for sharing it's a good point of view um joy is next joy hello hi Hey, um, and happy first day of summer from Phoenix, Arizona, where it's 107. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. It's only, it's only June, right? I know, right? I, <laughs> We're just so yeah, getting started. Uh, in, in thinking about sparking joy, um, and uh, yeah, by the name, by the way, my name is Joy, so there oh, you go. Oh, right. Um, so You're yeah, an expert. I, I had to put a caveat to that because a lot of things in my house spark joy, right? Mm -hmm. But I had to think, you know what? Does it spark enough joy to take a spot? 
in my house mm. because, and I heard from another minimalist, I think she was called the minimal mom. And she said, um, everything you own is a task, whether it's, um, you know, something that you write down that you have to take care of, but it's sort of a, an unspoken to-do list, everything that you own in your home. Mm -hmm. um, it does require that you do something with it, dust it, water it, move it, you know. So I just added another caveat and another layer of joy uh, to help me decide. And some things didn't make the cut, so... Well, and there you go. So you, you refined it to make it work for you. That's excellent. Thank you. Exactly. Thanks, Joy. And uh, Deborah's Deborah. next. Um, about the spark, Joy. I was extremely skeptical and uh, until I was doing my clothing and I'm, I think probably compared to most, I'm relatively minimalist. So um I was five or six items in and I picked up a t-shirt and I um, felt a frisson of excitement. And I thought, oh my goodness, now I know what it means to spark joy. <laughs> and I still have that t-shirt. It's merino wool, it's tattered. It has walked about 800 kilometers with me across Spain. It has been everywhere with me. But when I touch this t-shirt, I have a spark of, of excitement. And this is not true for everything, but I do strongly, strongly believe that when you have a tool, whether it be a toilet brush, like we've talked about last session, or um, a hairbrush or uh, whatever, a plant pot, when it's attractive, when it's functional, when it does its job, um, then that is joyful. It mm -hmm. is a tool that does its job. And that makes my life easier. And truly speaking, I love functional items that are also beautiful, even if it's in their simplicity. So for me, those things truly spark joy. And yes, I have a toilet brush that sparks joy because it's attractive. It is functional and it looks good and it doesn't look like a plastic piece of crap. And so everything that makes that you happy, beautiful, everything that is beautiful to me, sparks joy, as long as it's also functional. And that eliminates a surprising number of things. So yeah, I suspect those I two things about... coupled together, the pretty and functional. Yes. That gets yes. past the creative people that think everything is beautiful, right? <laughs> when you True. add the creativity onto the other end of it. Oh, that's good. Mm. Great. Thanks, Deborah. Appreciate it. Uh, Samudra, you had your hand up? That well-worn stuff that um, I think it was Deborah talking about that quality is called shibumi in Japanese. The, the, shibumi? The, yep, the uh, beauty of something that is well-worn, beautifully worn and held up underwear and it shows the love that's been given it and the help it's given. And the opposite, the beauty of something new is shibui. Oh. And <laughs> that, that's for Marie Kondo fans who are into oh. Japanese. And to the criterion of spark joy, and I know what, you mean about the free song of when you touch it. Um, but there's also the question of, do I need it? So sparking joy, I have, I own some things that don't spark joy, be, like my mop does not spark joy. I have the nicest mop I can, but still, you know, what right. you saying about the toilet brush. <clears throat> so my ultimate criterion is what I have to replace it if I didn't own it. Which is a good one. That's a very good one. It's so does your part so joy, is it functional? And would I have to replace it if I didn't own it? Those, okay, we're refining. Good job. Thanks, Samudra. Thank we you. We are out of time. So oh, Susan, I hope you'll be back with us next week. And I yeah. think we will pick up, we'll pick up next week on this very same topic topic because i think this is kind of the heart of the matter for a lot yeah, of people yeah yeah there's a lot to say about this right um uh, one thing i want to make sure we talk about next week is you know well there are the there are kind of two extremes that i think are worth talking more about one is people for whom everything sparks joy because of their their particular nature creative in nature yes and then also people who for because of health or mental health issues don't experience joy at all or rarely experience joy and how those how like depression complicates clutter and decluttering 
So we'll yeah, come back yeah, to yeah. those next week. Um, <clears throat> we will meet again next Tuesday, June 28th at noon U U.S. Central Time. And we're going to continue with this, this very same topic. What a great discussion we've had. We if so love everybody's participating. Thank you so much for joining in the conversation. If you are watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live to get notifications about uh, upcoming events. We invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. Someone very soon is going to be our lucky 3,000th meetup group member. That's coming up really close. Woo you can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We also publish our, we save the audio from our edited video and publish it as a podcast available in all the usual places where podcasts are distributed. And we, our podcast distributor recently made the option of monetizing our podcasts available. So we have turned that on. So you will now hear some, hear some ads, which we're hoping will be few and judiciously placed. But I want to shout out to our podcast listeners and say, please let us know, write us an email. If there's anything, you know, if you hear an ad, you don't, that you find objectionable or if the placement is not working well or anything like that, because this is a new experiment for us. So please let us know, drop an email to hccm at cfhou.com. What they're advertising is other podcast shows. They're not advertising products. They're advertising other shows on the platform. So right. um, you're and just I, getting an idea of who, what other shows you can listen to. Well, and I'm trying to, to uh, select them Care, you know, carefully listen. I listen through their ads, make sure that they are not anything that our our listeners would find objectionable, um, and also things that sound like they'd be interesting to our particular audience. Right. Um, so we love to hear from you. So please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere else that you find us. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, you guys, again. We just are so excited that um, there's so much conversation and interaction about this topic, and we wanted to um, we we wanted to respond to the request for conversation about Marie Kondo, and we did it, and you guys have totally joined in the party. So we thank you so much, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.